<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, Wednesday edition of the Craft Beer Hangout for the past couple of weeks uh, my good friend Matthew Miller has been aggressively and Gil Mello has been helping him as well uh, they've been very aggressively lining up a series of brewers to come in on Wednesday if you're a regular viewer for the craft beer nation hangout you know that we normally go Friday nights at 10 Eastern but what we've been doing is reaching out to the craft brew scene getting brewers getting brewmasters getting the guys that are making the beer that we love to drink and getting them into hangouts where we can grill them ask them the tough questions like where did you get your first kiss at and things like that and uh, just go from there so on this special Wednesday night edition we have Brett Porter and Andrew Osterman from Goose Island Goose Island you may know them if you like craft beer in any way shape or form uh, they've just recently gone through a lot of expansion and uh, that expansion results in stuff like this two whole cases of empties so you know there we go <laughs> so now that I have my credentials out of the way and my sucking up is finished uh, let's see let's run through the panel here real quick the regulars Matthew Miller welcome ah uh, thank you glad to be here enjoying a thank little bit of a enjoying a stout on a Wednesday night no complaints from me excellent Gil welcome Welcome, welcome. Oh, hello everybody. Yeah, I'm very happy. Uh, drinking any day of the week. That's fun. <laughs> Mike, what's going on with you, Michael? Which hey, room man. of your house are you in tonight? That's the kitchen, isn't it? Oh, I'm in the kitchen. So Okay. All right. No what are you drinking? Tonight. Uh, I'm drinking uh, Goose Island's uh, Mild Winter tonight. Um, oh. Out of irony for uh, the terrible winter that we've had here in Minnesota. <laughs> Six inches uh, two days ago, 12 inches a week ago. Excellent. Randy Gardner Jr. is going to be reviewing Mother Goose Island, t apparently, tonight. So, And don't forget to unmute before you talk, Randy. I am unmuted. Excellent. And I decided to bring my little daughter along for the ride tonight so the world can look at her in awe. There you go. Well, you needed a designated driver anyway. That's right. <laughs> called genetic improvement. And, I'm <laughs> <laughs> and it begins. Thanks, Gil. And I'm, I'm drinking the Père Jacques. Excellent. Fantastic. Which is what I'm going to crack open here in just a minute as well. So that's awesome. Okay. Now that I've run through all the regulars, which nobody cares about, let's get to our special guest stars. Uh, I've got uh, Brett Porter and Andrew Osterman. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks Thank very you. much. And what just happened? Mike just rejoined. Okay, excellent. So, um, obviously, Goose Island, as we said, why don't you guys uh, give us your backgrounds, uh, what you do for Goose Island, and um, just tell us a little bit about yourselves real quick. Okay? Wait, Lee, you don't want to give Felix any love? That's all right. <sighs> Felix is a West Coast. Felix, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'm sorry. Felix uh, Estrada, special guest. You guys are gonna have to sit for one second. Felix, hi. How are you? Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt, guys. Uh, glad to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Um, pop in the Sophie um, oh. and my Goose Island glass. Which, uh, oh, that's what I need. Flying the flag. <laughs> All right, and let's hear from our guests. How about Brett Porter? Yeah, there we go. Guys, thanks for having me tonight. I am uh, drinking. I'll be drinking three things tonight. I've got uh, our Kolsch Summertime, and I have uh, a bottle of, uh, I've got a, bo a vintage bottle of Matilda from last year, and the right glass for it. And then I have uh, my favorite beer drinking glass in the whole world, um, a, a uh, dimple mug that I stole from uh, uh, a bar in England, which shall remain unnamed, that I'm going to be drinking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, are they going to come after you if they find well, out? Or? Well, it happened. It happened. It happened back in the in the uh, in the in the mid '80s. So uh, I'm going to drink the Night Stalker. Uh, I think in that uh, one, if there's time. I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited. It sounds like Brett is a glass snob, uh, like Gil and I are. So uh, we'll we'll be working <laughs> up with some questions on that. Excellent, Andy. What about you? Um, I have Matilda right now, the love of my life, in proper glassware as well. Um, it's a 2012, so vintage as well. And then I might dig into some of that stuff 
as we go along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were showing that off in the uh, pregame show. I'm quite jealous of every bit of it. I just want you to know. Now, uh, the part that we didn't it's cover. Just the outside boxes. Oh, even the fact that you have that. Darn you. I work in a cubicle for a living. You get to work there. God, it's just not even remotely fair, but that's cool. <laughs> um, so what do you guys both do? Why don't you uh, describe your positions for Goose Island? Andrew, kick it off, buddy. I'll kick it off. Um... I am the brand manager for the, the vintage ales, so Matilda, Soapy, uh, Pear Jack, and Pepe Nero, as well as our, our growing wine barrel program, um, which includes Lolita, Juliet, Madame Rose, and a few new things to come, and then also Bourbon County Stout. Ooh, sounds yeah, good. It is. And, uh, and Brett, is. yourself? I, I'm the brewmaster at Goose Island. Um, I've been at Goose for three years. Um, before that, I was five years as head brewer at Deschutes in Bend, Oregon. Oh. Then uh, for 14 years, I worked at Portland Brewing Company in Portland, Oregon, the brewery that makes, uh, continues, makes McTar continues to make McTarnahan's. Yep. And then I, uh, before that, I worked in England. I worked from 88 to 91 in a small, traditional, all-cast brewery called Bunce's Brewery, right on the Avon River, about one of the branches of the Avon River, about uh, 14 miles north of Stonehenge. So, wow. 1988, uh, when I started, 1988, when Goose Island started. So, uh, I, I feel a certain, uh, I feel a kinship with uh, Goose uh, having started in 88, um, even though I've only been at Goose for three years. <clears throat> that's fine. That's fine. So it sounds like uh, you've really lived the dream as uh, as like an itinerant brewer for a while now. That's exactly, awesome. Exactly. I got into the industry when it was possible to do so. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back when there were what six breweries, and that was entire that was the entirety of the U.S. brewing scene. Back then, just yeah. About, I, right? I, you know, I didn't get to go to the my. You know, I went to Portland uh, after having worked in a, a brewery for three years, and I went to my favorite brewery there and asked them for a job and they uh they didn't hire me i went to another one uh again they didn't hire me it was hard to get work and um uh i finally went to the one where uh i, I finally went well obviously to portland brewing company but what i remember about portland brewing company in the early days was their beer was always <laughs> the most oxidized <laughs> <laughs> Oops, I hate and, it when that happens. I'll tell you that um, back in 88, I, there were very few breweries uh, that really knew what they were doing. And um, uh, so uh, my daughter just walked in the door. Sweetie, what's going on? Uh, Will you shut the door? Okay. Yeah, I've got the... <laughs> it's family <laughs> night here on the hangout. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in our, uh, I'm in our, uh, I'm in our. Uh, I, I just got off the train and I'm hanging out at home now. Uh, had a couple of really, really long nights. It's really nice to be home and really nice to be talking to you guys. So, excellent. So, when you approached the first brewery, did you have any formal training at that point, or was it all passion? Uh, no, no, no formal training. Uh, formal training wasn't required. Uh, I uh, was working as a. I worked. Uh, I was working for a an orchestra in England at the time, and an orchestra. I lied on my inner on my my resume <laughs> like so many people do. So, and uh, I I played up. Uh, I was doing marketing for them, and I played up my marketing skills. So I. <laughs> Though I, I had brewed beer and wine, a, a, quite a lot of it at home uh, as a teenager. So um, I knew what I was doing. Wow. No, you know, don't take this wrong, but if you did that as a teenager, that was like pre the complete joy of home brewing days, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. You know, we had a place and there was a place in my hometown where you could buy, uh, you know, malt extract and um I will tell you wow. though, my first batch of beer, our first batch of alcoholics, or, or my first, my first foray into fermentation was uh, apple wine, and there are very few people who've tasted that, and uh, the, those who have uh, would have uh, perhaps uh, steered me towards uh, <laughs> another. Uh, Don't give up your day job, right? Yeah, <laughs> my, my high school, my high school day job. <laughs> 
But if you're a teenager, you weren't brewing for taste, right? <laughs> you know what? I, I, it, it may sound stupid and snobby, but I was brewing for taste. I was, you know, I, I had uh, my parents. Uh, my parents uh, 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 lived in in Oxford and and Edinburgh, and we. I got to drink when I was a kid because they, just every other kid did, and um, they they didn't care if as long as I you know kept it under control. So. They they kind of knew what I was doing, uh, you know. I was sort of doing it. Uh, I wouldn't really tell them what I was doing. What sixteen year old tells their parents what they're doing? So true. Uh, but I, I I was brewing for taste, and uh, my first couple batches of beer were much better than uh, much better than uh, the apple wine that I made. God, it was horrible. I can taste <laughs> it now. I can see I it now. I can still remember the very first batch of beer I ever brewed. A friend and I thought it would be great to do a jalapeno uh, pale ale, uh -huh. and it was horrible. It was in every way, shape, or form horrible. So, so I feel you on that one, without a doubt. Uh, so, I'm a ways since then. So, yeah, I'm going to have to say <laughs> you've gone much further down the road than I ever went, without a doubt. No, you know, no question there. Um, so the uh, the Jacques Pep, uh, the Pierre Jacques is amazing. I'm loving this beer. This is fantastic. Yeah, it's a it's a remarkably uh, a remarkably uh, good beer. Uh, yeah. It is uh, it's a bit of an enigma. Uh, how yep. we don't really know what to call it. I mean, it's <laughs> a double double or a quadruple. I know um, it's got it's got a little bit of that that uh, Belgian funk going on. Uh, yeah. A little yeah. bit of sour. This is good. It's, it's quite alcoholic as well. Um, uh, oh it's yay! Very, it's a, but it's hidden. The alcohol is hidden nicely, though. Um, the uh, yes. Uh, and so the the story behind that is that uh, uh, our brewmaster Greg Hall went to uh, Belgium and was was lucky to get into uh, the monastery, uh, uh, the, the the Rochefort monastery, and uh, very hard thing to do and. The person that let him in was uh, named Per Jacques, and that's why ah. the, uh, the beer is an homage to Per Jacques. He was the uh, uh, the Paul Mall smoking uh, <laughs> beer brewing abbot of Rochefort Abbey, and uh, he he was uh, he was very uh, good to uh, Greg Hall and the people who were with him. So nice. Uh, he bought a uh, he, he, he had a beer named after him. He also uh, he, he found out later there was a beer that was named after him, and he's reputed to have said, uh, "Vel my royalties." So <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of sounded like Joseph Goebbels there. I apologize, my French accent was, or my Belgian accent wasn't quite there, but he, that's uh, all right. He uh, he was uh, he was uh, he was unhappy not to. Uh, uh, to be able to enrich the church's coffers, with the, <laughs> but he, apparently he's now retired and uh, but still lives uh, still lives on the premises. He uh, was a very proud brewer, but uh, I think he was. What I understand from the people who were on that trip, he was most proud of the work that he had done to restore the uh, Abbey Church that was there. So he was putting uh, the proceeds back into. Uh, to good use. Yes. Excellent. That's funny. So, uh, Roast for a 10, which is probably what I consider to be one of the best beers probably in the world, is, is that uh, what was in mind in the making of this? No, it wasn't. This? Um, the, it, they, it wasn't. They weren't looking for anything specific. They, uh, and we, uh, we ferment the beer. Um, the, the recipe is absolutely our own. Um, the only the only thing that uh, that we borrowed is the, the you know is, is the yeast strain. Lots of breweries have, have, have borrowed that yeast strain. Um, it's a very finicky yeast strain. It uh, it doesn't particularly like uh, the osmotic pressure of high high um, you know high uh, concentrations of sugar in the wort. So we brew uh, the, when we make a when we make a, a batch of beer we. We uh, we uh, brew it so that the gravity is slightly lower on the first batch. Um, let the yeast get started on a slightly lower uh, uh, lower lower plate of wort, 
and then the subsequent batches are brewed to a higher gravity, and it it sort of coaxes the yeast into uh, into mm -hmm. uh, asexual reproduction and and then fermentation. You know, sometimes the subtle approach works if that's your goal. You know, there's nothing subtle about the beer, though. It's uh, no, <laughs> it, it's a it is a a very very uh, uh, you know it it has a uh, very pronounced esters. You pick up yeah. um, ethyl acetate and isoamyl acetate, and there's there's a uh, uh, acetaldehyde uh, all come to the fore there. It's a it's a beer that's uh, that's sweet and slightly syrupy. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a delicious beer. It doesn't really fit into any particular car uh, category, uh, at least not here in the United States. So I, I I love the nose. The nose is you can use any descriptor for the aroma coming off of this beer that you want to, except boring. It, it's not boring in any way, shape, or form. Huge, uh, huge fan. No, it's not boring, especially. And look at the glass you've got there. That is uh, <laughs> not going to be boring. Well, I mean, I just put an entire seven hundred and sixty-five milliliter <laughs> into this glass. So. <laughs> You need to show that bottle to. Uh, you need to put that bottle up so people can see it. That is our new package. Uh, I love oh, that. Here we go. Yeah, hey. will you put it up again. There you go. Bottle up again so people can see it, and maybe pull back a little bit so they can see the the, the shape of it. Yes. So we are we are uh, filling uh, 765 milliliter bottles uh, now with our with our beers. Um, they're very substantial bottles. We had a lot yeah. of fun. Uh, the first night, and Andrew can attest to this too. Uh, our director of operations wanted to christen our new 765 milliliter line. Oh God! He, did he so use crazy. one of these? Yes, he did. Yeah. And uh, so he he wailed on the inlet, the 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 you know the the table where we where the, the glass goes on initially. You know, and this is a this is a this is we're talking about a 1.8 million dollar project, and he just took a colossal dance in that. In the in, on the infeed table, and the <laughs> bottle would not break. For no. so he had to go to a he had to go to a metal he had to go to an I beam, steel I painted steel I beam and break the bottle. And he and the, the bottle shattered everywhere. And um, our sa our our brewery safety director was uh, showered with beer, and uh, <laughs> it was it was it was it was, uh, it was one of the better nights at work. <laughs> <laughs> Our safety director showered with this uh, with beer. Uh, nice. I, I'm planning on holding on to this bottle as a home defense mechanism. Yeah, I, I you know, <laughs> you can actually, uh, you know, if you, if you. Uh, uh, One second, folks. I'll be right back. Matthew, take over, please. Is the, uh, <laughs> I wonder if it's, do they have like champagne indented on the bottom for pressure or are they just have extra heavy glass for, for light? They're, they're, no, they're, they're. It, it's a much uh, more expensive package. Uh, you know, first of all, you have to have a you have to have the, uh, the equipment to fill those bottles. But uh, it's a, all of those beers, um, all the beers that we put into those uh, into those size bottles uh, have have you could you're you're able to lay those beers down, and we think they can last uh, continue to change and evolve over five years and. Uh, one of the things that happens to the beers like Matilda and Sophie and uh, some of the other sisters is that they have live Britannomyces bruxellensis and other uh, other wild yeast in Sorry them. About they, that. Continue to, uh, they continue to they continue to uh, ferment in the bottle, so the carbonation continues to go up. So this is a much uh, this is a much more appropriate package for a beer that's still alive. For yeast that's still alive and still uh, metabolizing uh, sugar, and you guys know that, uh, you know, Brett Brett Brooks is is the is is a, a buzzword around uh, around the uh, the brewing world these days, and it is it is remarkable a remarkable organism. I've got a I've got a picture of, of our our ale yeast and also Brett Brooks um, at my desk. Uh, to remind me every day how special it is. There's <laughs> one of the pictures has you know our ale yeast and they're nice. They're they're beautiful little uh, uniform cells. And then the the Brett Brooks it's smaller. But there's one particular cell 
that looks like an alien spacecraft. It is a. It has two bulbs on the end of a of a of a of a rod that's at least uh, uh, you know. It's 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 uh, its length is about ten regular yeast cells long. Nice. That is a very unusual. Uh, very unusual. Most no, really most unusual. other people most other people get pictures of their kids on their desk, but I guess that's really kind of <laughs> true for you as well, isn't it? I I I, I too have pictures of my children on my, on my desk. Too. That, that's a billion do. cells. One of the nice things about one of the things about Britannomyces is that uh, it, it's exceptionally hardy, and we yep. uh, we. I, I, I've got to think that in the United States, we're using more Britannomyces bruxellensis than any other brewery. Um, we're making lots and lots of Matilda, and mm -hmm. we are, uh, you know, we're adding it to, uh, we're adding, uh, you know, 300,000 cells per mill to a 400-barrel batch of Matilda uh, once or twice a week. So, wow, that's a little bread. It's it's between nine thousand and eighteen thousand dollars worth of of Brett, if you had to buy it from a yeast lab, so we're we're propagating Lord. We're propagating yeast uh, at a at a prodigious rate, and uh, Brett is not the easiest. Brett Rex or Brett Lambicus is not the easiest uh, easiest uh, 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 wild yeast to propagate. Excellent. Um, I want to jump over, if you don't mind, Brett. Uh, I want to jump over to Andrew for just a minute or two. Um, Andrew, talk to us about how you came to wear that wonderful Goose Island polo that you've got there. Yeah, um, I'm from Lincoln, Nebraska originally, and you know, five, six, seven years ago, started drinking a lot of craft beer in in Lincoln. It was uh, mostly Boulevard was kind of what we got. Kansas City is pretty close, so. Kind of came up on, on Boulevard and started drinking a lot of beers, but at the time didn't really understand styles um, and, and really what I was tasting. And then one day, a, a guy that I was helping kind of reinvent a bar um, with kind of my marketing background and stuff, handed me a, a glass of Matilda. And I tried it for the first time, and like my whole my mind was just blown. And... Uh, <laughs> complexity and the depth and, and just the flavor profile and everything. I'd never tasted a beer that that tasted anything like it. And I mean I can still picture right then the whole like entirety of what I was gonna do with my life changed. Um wow, so, nice. Yeah. I, I, so when I said earlier that this is uh you know the love of my life, it, it she definitely is. Uh, don't tell my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> what's, her, what's her name? Maybe you can get Brett to name one after her. Yeah. Um, and so I, I ran a bar for about three years, and, and Matilda was the beer that I, you know, anytime somebody would come in and say, what should I try? I was like, you got to try this Matilda. <laughs> and ended up getting a job with um, the distributor there in Lincoln um, as their craft and import, um, you know, salesperson. And uh, I told them in my interview that, you know, they said, where do you see yourself in five years? And, and I told them, you know, my goal is to work for Goose Island. That, that's where I want to be. I fell in love with the, with the beer and the brewery and, and the yep. stories that, that um, are all around that beer. And um, that was March 1st of 2010. And March 1st of 2011, I was starting at Goose Island. So very moved cool. to Chicago, and, and here I am. How many, how many Belgian styles are you guys making right now? Four or five, right? There are there are four in uh, in the vintage lineup, and then um, we've got some on on wine barrels that that are based off of Belgian beers as well. In so the I've got, I've got a list here of Belgian beers. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, eleven. Oh, and they're bottle in bottle production, or they're in. Um, the two of them will be draft only. Yep. Which and, two are those? Uh, we're making uh, we're making a special version of of uh, Sophie this year, and which fact, actually yeah. just it just hit wholesalers this week, so it'll it'll start to make it to market this week. It's called uh, Sophie Paradiso. It is, uh, oh. you know, when we make we make regular, uh, and I guess I shouldn't call it regular. There's nothing regular about Sophie. Uh, amazing. 
Soapy is a uh, sa is a saison that we uh, that we we barrel age a portion of it uh, with uh, and in and along with the uh, Britannomyces bruxellensis in the wine barrels, we put uh, the peel of forty pounds of oranges. Put that all in the in the, the cask and let it sit for uh, three months. Well, with this uh, with uh, Sophie Paradiso, we took uh, we took uh, three thousand pounds of we took three thousand pounds of uh, grapefruit. We all fresh fruit. We peeled all of them, and then we. Uh, we, we macerated the flesh and put them into many, many wine barrels. So where we would put, uh, we, we put, uh, uh, we put, it has 60% more, uh, it's not entirely wine barrel aged, but it's 60% uh, of, the, of the beer is, uh, has this uh, mixture of uh, grapefruit peel and grapefruit uh, juice in it. It's uh, a very, uh, a very, uh, it, it's an amazing uh, variation on Sophie. That nice. Awesome. That, that sounds tasty. I'm going to be looking for it, definitely. Um, Felix, you had a couple questions. Uh, take it. Run. We, well, yeah, so um, actually our, our beloved friend Randy Gardner Jr. was um, <laughs> questioning the, he, he, he was a little perturbed that he couldn't tell the difference between all the different beers. He's like, okay, so, and and I, I totally get it. I, I think I did some research before I actually bought them, but Belgian style ale on almost every single one of your Belgian beers, and it's like, okay, what 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 am I actually getting? What's going on there? How why is there nothing on this label that um, tells me what it is? I I well, I think we all kind of agreed that they're beautiful labels, but there's not a lot going on. The 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 colors change between the different beers. The the font I think says it's consistent, but there's not a lot to there's not a lot of, of tell of what's what you're actually buying if you're, if you're new to the beer. Right. So um, the Belgian style ale on the front of the label is is something that um, at the time we were required to put on there. Um, we we've, we've since been uh, talked to the TTB and and we the new 765s. Lee, I think if you uh, well, maybe not Père Jacques, because like Brad said, it, it's not defined by a style, but Matilda now says Belgian-style pale ale. And yeah, so this says Belgian-style Abbey ale on it. Does the, does the Père Jacques is the one that you age on the wine barrels? Um, Père Jacques is not aged on wine barrels, no. Okay. But if you, turn, if you turn the labels on the side, it does have a, a little description on it. So Matilda says pale ale re-fermented with Britannomyces. Um, so there's a little bit of a description, um, but you're right. It's not it's not out in front of, of that description, and um, it's something that we've we've talked about. And our our secondary packaging, the four packs, will have a little bit more of the story on it um, in the future. And we're we're listening and changing it up a little bit. I, I will give you this. For the Pierre Jacques on the back uh, label, it does say that it develops in the bottle for up to five years, uh, yeah. contains live yeast, a sediment may form. So that's good. Yeah, that's awesome. That's an awesome note. And it also says that it's an the, Abbey uh, Ale, too. The, the, and and I, the idea, I, I think, is uh, that uh, we're trying to provide a little bit of mystery as well, you know? Uh, so we hope that people will discover these. These will be uh, these will be discoveries that uh, people will make, um, and uh, that they'll come to uh, love these beers. And and uh, we're the the sort of consumer that we're looking for to uh, enjoy these beers are the are are uh, the adventuresome people who are willing to try something new and uh, don't need someone to tell them what it's going to taste like. Uh, just jump. Just I mean, we, we're kind of asking people to jump in and try it and, and hope that you like it. You guys Very are cool. so making me want to get another bottle of this Pierre Jacques <laughs> and just sit on that for like two years. <laughs> just hold it for like two years and see what happens. Okay. Yeah. All right. You know, um, you know, honestly, from, go ahead, from just to finish on um, on Brett's note there, we, me as a beer consumer, I do that very thing. I find a brewery that I know 
that it's a there's a known quantity. I know the quality of the styles of beer, or whatever or the kind of beer they make, whatever the style is, and I'll buy one off the shelf just to give it a shot. So, uh, you know, if 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 Sophie doesn't sell it, then at least uh, Goose Island probably sells it off the shelf. Well, I hope yeah, that's definitely. Um, we, uh, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're we we've, we've rolled out to uh, all fifty states now, and we're hoping that uh, we're hoping that people will try our our beers. We don't really have the uh, you know, there's not a, a huge uh, you know, we're not having going to have a, a a television marketing campaign behind uh, all the brands that we do. So, <laughs> People are going to have to. Uh, hopefully, they've heard of uh, us from things like uh, our 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 uh, IPA winning uh, six medals at GABF and uh, uh, that sort of thing, and they'll give us a try. You know, we have had we have had some of the vintage line out in outlying states, um, but now uh, now uh, our, uh, our 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 core brands, our classic brands, um, are going out to. Uh, all 50 states, so people can get right. and all the the first beer that uh, <laughs> the first beer that uh, Goose Island ever made. They can get our IPA that uh, that I, I think you heard me tell you that it, it, I think it's one more 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 GABF medals than any other uh, IPA around. Um, and then uh, uh, and then uh, also uh, uh, our seasonals. So I was drinking summertime Kolsch there earlier and. Uh, that's a, a, a you know a true uh, a true uh, coal made with a coal yeast and now uh, now we're, we have a, a chance to age it for an appropriate period of time so that it tastes like a, a good German coal. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a knife edge there. If you overage the beer, you get it past its peak. Uh, if you don't, it's not theirs. So that's always cool. That's true. That's true. We found that uh, uh, we. We uh, this is one of the beers that uh, that we're having uh, we're having our uh, our uh, our uh, uh, sister breweries uh, in the larger AB uh, corporation brew brew with us uh, and they're able to hold this we were only able to hold this beer for five days at the brewery um, and it left some rough edges so we had we uh, when we when we made it at uh, we we made this beer in in uh, the brewery at Baldwinsville, New York. Um, we spent a, a lot of time trying to decide what the appropriate amount of time for aging was. And the first batch that went out to the to customers uh, was aged for 21 days. Um, and what we found at 21 days is that um, the uh, uh, acetaldehyde, the green apple flavor, was beginning yep. to uh, beginning to, to dominate. So we reduced the aging time to 15 days, and we're very happy with that. That is uh, that seems to be the ideal amount of uh, aging time for that beer, and it we've been uh, nice. we're definitely happy with it. Very cool. Now um, we were talking earlier, uh, Mike. Uh, I know that you had a couple questions about uh, brewing process, ingredient availability right. and such? Right. From the perspective of a home brewer, and I've talked to a number of different commercial brewers about this, but um, as we know, some ingredients are not, you know, have varying availability throughout the year. Uh -huh. From the standpoint of a brewer, how, what is, what is you, where is your balance in terms of using available ingredients that are to the letter of what your recipe dictates versus um, being free and willing to improv improvise. Um, what, from the perspective of brewer, what is where where is your priority lie? Hitting nailing the recipe to the T, or are you willing to be flexible? If you know, say a, a variety of hop or um, you know, uh, a, a lot of brewers have had to be uh, flexible about uh, about uh, what hop they use. Um, there, there's been a shortage of, of particular varieties. One is Amarillo, and uh, so we have had to uh, we've had to make some changes, like other breweries, and uh, make some substitutions. We've been uh, we've been very uh, uh, we've been very uh, conscious of the flavor, uh, making sure that we pick the right uh, substitutions. But um, we're we have uh, we have. Uh, now, compared to most craft brewers, uh, 
course, we have enormous resources behind us and unbelievable, uh, unbelievable <laughs> hot pockets. I'll I'll say um, we've been able to get uh, we've been able to get uh, some uh, extraordinary hops. Uh, 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 you know, airlifted over from Europe for a special uh, Hellas that we made. We made, nice. uh, we got a, we got uh, um, Lublin hops uh, from Poland that were that were shipped over uh, quite quickly to us. We have uh, 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 one thing that a lot of people don't know is that Anheuser Busch owns one of the, the largest hop farm in the United States, and it's uh, in northern Idaho. In, uh, northern Idaho. Northern Idaho. Wow. Um, all right. All right. Almost 2,000 acres, and uh, it's planted with uh, with the varieties of hops that uh, uh, that uh, Goose Island asked be planted there. So we nice. have uh, probably they probably have uh, 15 or 16 varieties in the ground, and um, they're growing uh, they're growing hops, and will be custom kilning them for us. So very uh, cool. Our our need for hops is uh, uh, well satiated. Well, no, it's not actually. We have uh, we have been, oh. which I really I'm quite proud of this. You, you know, I'm an Oregonian, and uh, uh, Oregon was the place where uh, Anheuser yeah. Busch contracted most of their their Willamette hops, and they uh, they stopped buying Willamette hops. They they uh, they gave the growers plenty. You know, they 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 paid out their contracts, and they uh, but but in place of, of Willamette hops now, um, uh, there are quite a few Oregon growers who have switched to Cascade. There was a Cascade shortage last year, um, and the 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 uh, the growers are uh, now uh, you know uh, they're getting back on a they're getting back on a, a, a more healthy footing. And uh, cool. Well, um, I'd like to jump in because uh, you kind of, you know, broke the seal on something that, of course, we're interested in talking with you guys about. And, you know, it's no secret that practically two years and a couple of weeks ago to the day, uh, Goose Island was picked up uh, almost entirely. Its shares were picked up by uh, Anheuser-Busch InBev or InBev Anheuser-Busch. Uh, sorry about that. So that brings up a lot of questions for lovers of craft beer and such like that. And I guess the biggest one, you guys are two years into this merger. Um, the, probably the biggest question is, what's changed? What's been, you know, pros and negatives, if you can go into them. What's, what's the pros and cons of, of being in that relationship with, uh, with InBev? Well, uh, speaking as a brewer and a beer nerd, uh, there are... There, there, there are more positives than negatives. Uh, they have a, they, they have a, a, a cadre of scientists down in, in uh, well, in, uh, in uh, St. Louis and also in Belgium. Uh, some of the best uh, uh, brewing science is happening in those places. When you need a particular uh, analysis of, uh, of your product, uh, it, it's right there. There are also experts at East Propaganda. They've helped us uh, with with uh, with that. Um, let me give you an example of uh, let me give you an example of their of what they've been able to do for us. Um, when we before we were purchased by Anderson Bush, uh, we'd sit around with Matilda, uh, uh, Andrew's girlfriend beer, and what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a story there that we're gonna save that for the next time you guys hang out with us. Okay. The, the, uh, 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 the, so here's what would happen: we would we would uh, uh, the, the fermentation, the primary fermentation would finish, we would add Anamyces to the to the beer, and then we wait a couple of weeks, and then we taste it, and um, we sit around stupidly looking at each other and go, "Hey, uh, do you taste any Anamyces in here?" And we sort of look quizzically at each other and. And um, we we'd have to decide whether the uh, you know whether the beer had had a long enough time uh, in contact with Britannomyces uh, to be releasable as uh, as uh, Matilda. Well, um, and he said, we we decided that uh, we decided that we wanted to look for the marker compounds that are important <laughs> in this beer. So we're able to use a piece of machinery called a 
gas chromatograph olfa olfactory olfactory mass spectrophotometer. So well, you threw what? some science at it, right? It's the yeah. olfactory mass spec, and it <laughs> it's a machine that it's a machine that uh, that I, I only know of one other craft brewer that has one, and that's Sierra Nevada. They may have two of them, and they use it to look at uh, they use it to look at hop aroma compounds. Well, um, AB has innumerable has as more of these than I have fingers, and um, <laughs> so we were able to send a sample of Matilda to the to the uh, um, down to St. Louis to have them look for these marker compounds, and um, we are uh, um, hi Lewis. <laughs> Here's my son Lewis. Look. <laughs> Hi, Lewis. Welcome to the Hangout. How are you doing, buddy? So the, the easy answer um, to, to summarize Brett's thing is, hey. is really more beer. <laughs> we get to produce more beer and let more people drink it, and we get to create more beer. Okay. Um, Right. Okay, so so you guys you guys obviously have access to to some world class, no doubt, world class laboratory equipment and even to a large degree recipe ingredients. Um, what about the creative control? Do you guys have to answer to corporate with what the recipes are, balance sheets, stuff like that? Is there some, or are you giving free range? calculator telling you to use cheaper malts or any of that kind of stuff? Well, the, the AV doesn't use cheaper malts. Uh, they they never have. Uh, they're the you know, I, what, a story that a lot of people don't know is that uh, AB's had this. Uh, um, they have a CLU. <laughs> <laughs> Ejected. Uh, is that uh, they've uh, they're the they have really been uh, uh, they're one of the reasons that uh, malt quality in the U.S. is so good because they they go into a plant and audit it and they say you need you need to improve this this and this. And if you have any doubt about that, call uh, call up uh, you know a, a, St. A, Louis. Yeah, Mr. Mr. and ask them what. But but let's let's talk. You know, if, you know I've talked I've talked about the the hop farm and, and um, what's happening in Leuven and St. Louis. Um, what I have found most refreshing are the pockets of brewing passion that you find in uh, in in in. Uh, in St. Louis and elsewhere, that I wasn't really prepared for that, and I, I don't really know why I wasn't. But um, there are, there are uh, kindred spirits in uh, in nice. the larger company that are so excited about what we're doing at Goose Island and so excited about brewing in general that it's a pleasure to work with them. That's cool. Now I I know we had a we had a couple of other. I'm sorry, say again. I, let's talk about let's talk about some of the some of the stuff that's inconvenient and. Uh, and has been a bit, a, a bit, uh, and, and and been a bit, a bit troublesome. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to talk to you about that. We have, uh, um, <laughs> we have. Uh, Should we go off air for this? No. <laughs> like passively like, get into our uh, offices. No, I will tell you, it, it we uh, we uh, in, until uh, uh, we were purchased by AB, we had a lousy safety record. And uh, they 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 uh, they came in and they said, "Listen, you guys are doing this, this, and this wrong. You guys need to fix it. And you need to fix it right now." And so it was a little bit. Uh, it, it was um, it was it was a wake up call, and it's been very hard work to come up to AB safety standards. But we haven't had a we haven't had a a, a, a lost time injury in in over a year where uh, before oh, we'd had wow. you know we had. Four, we'd had four in you know a, a single calendar year. I mean, and these were we had some debilitating injuries that happened. Yeah, awful. you know, I work in uh, I work in IT project management, and we always refer to developers or or installation and infrastructure installations by their level of maturity. They're very <laughs> immature. Whoa, bless you, Tara. Bless you, Jesus Christ. Bless you. Um, anyway, we refer to them by their level of maturity. The really immature ones waste a lot of time and energy not doing things properly. The real mature ones jump in, get crap done, and get out. So it sounds like AB has has forced some maturity within the brew process, or you know, within your operations in the in the it, brew it house. It hasn't really been the brew process. Uh, it's it's been uh, it's been our. Uh, uh, you know, right. Simple things like uh, the like infrastructure making stuff. Making the plant safe, 
Uh, one of the things, if you were to come to Goose Island, um, the, is that there's an enormous amount of forklift traffic, and we had the we have a, we had the potential for uh, forklift pedestrian accidents. And you and forklift pedestrian accidents are the worst possible thing that can happen because the pedestrian usually ends up dismembered. So I don't want to I don't want to dwell on this, but uh, we needed a, we needed a shake up there. Well, that's good to hear. Um, now, I know that several members of the, well, not that you needed the shakeup, but that you got the shakeup and you responded okay. Um, so, I know that we had a couple of other questions about all of this. Um, who else wants to go next? Tara, did you have a question or besides the sneeze? <laughs> She's muted and allergic to beer. <laughs> I am oh, not no. allergic to beer. That was, you know what? I grew up with someone who was allergic to beer. They were allergic to hops, and I thought oh, that was very terrible. Bad. What, what did they do to piss God off? I mean, seriously. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good question. Um, questions. I don't like being put on the spot. I'll come up All right, with we'll, we'll come back to you. I have a question that I had. Uh, Go ahead, Gil. I was wondering because you have some uh, brew pubs, and correct me if I'm wrong, that did not got included on the sale, right? And uh, how does the beer? How do you guys handle the beers that were made in brew pub? Do you do you guys make those beers as well, or they do their own stuff? How does that work? They they uh, they buy uh, some of the beers from us, and we have a uh, we, the the brewers at the brew pubs, uh, and the, and the brewers and. We have a we have a very close relationship. Um, we just, uh, we just uh, 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 bottled. Uh, was it yesterday or today? No, I think it was today. Our our 25th anniversary beer, and it was a collaboration between uh, the head brewer at our 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 uh, brew pub, a guy named Nick Barron, and then our old brewmaster Greg Hall and myself. Uh, so we have a very tight relationship. We can't. Um, uh, it's against uh, uh, against uh, uh, TTB regs for uh, Anna's or Bush to own pubs. So uh, we mm -hmm. the, the pubs are not are are still separate, but we're still connected. It's still our home. It's still it, it it's an important part of uh, of our heritage. Just like uh, just like uh, making sure that we're making uh, lots of uh, you know lots more specialty beers out of our Chicago. Uh, Chicago plant, so it, the pubs are they're separate, but we have a we have a very close relationship uh, with them, and we often uh, um, you know we share um, uh, they they you know it it it's a pretty cool thing I think so nice very nice I just want to uh, say real quick that I am really digging this pair of jock and uh yeah like same here. It almost it almost drinks like a um, in my opinion, Lee and Lee, you can tell me to shut up if, if I'm if you disagree, but <laughs> it really it almost drinks like a quad, and I'm this is my yep. first time having it, and I'm like, dude, what? Like I, I've been missing out on this for a while. I need to yeah, get this, some more of this. To me, this uh, this almost approaches barley wine. I mean, it's good. It's thick. It's got a bit of chew to it. Nice ABV. I mean, I'm I'm digging the crap out of this. I really am. The only thing the only thing about it is that um, you know that 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 separates it from a barley wine is that uh, it it's uh, it it's the, the, the many of the you know the predominant flavors are derived by the yeast. So there's a there's an unmistakable malt character there too, but it's balanced by this very uh, very assertive yeast character. So we are making uh, this year one of the beers that we're going to be releasing is a uh, a, a bourbon barrel aged barley wine, um, and so you, people are going to get that'll be something new for people uh, to try. Nice, nice. Uh, let's see who uh, Doug. I believe you were next up. You had a question, sir. Well, now the uh, the comment of the bourbon barrel aged barley wine has made me think of something else as well. But I, I noticed. Um, <laughs> We've mentioned the bottles several times, and that's, all of them say can develop over five years in the bottle. Were were trials done beforehand before you you know beers were released to the public, or was it just like a hey, let's just throw five years on everything? Since the 
everything I've ever seen, they all say develops over five years in the bottle. You know, um, that's that's a that's an excellent question, and I, I think that in the early days it was uh, it was it was it was our fondest hope that these beers would last five years, but we have. And, and you know, it, it all depends on how they're kept. I mean, if you keep keep a bottle of Pear Jacques on your back porch, it's not going to last for five years. But um, we, uh, the beers that we that we say we're going to keep uh, that that will develop over five years, we actually uh, began a pro a program uh, about two and a half years ago called B Salts, and it stands for don't doesn't matter what it stands for, but we are saving every one of these beers. <laughs> And we periodically test them over, taste them over, uh, over, over time, and then also run them through the lab to make sure that the the carbonation is correct and that that they're not um, that they're not uh, they haven't gone uh, sour or, or that would be the sour multi sour. So we are actually we're we're quite confident uh, uh, we're we're quite, we're quite confident from what we've seen so far from this. Uh, saving every one of these beers um, and tasting them periodically that they are will last. They're, they're going to age well. And we do have, uh, you know, we do have, uh, we do have uh, beers that are well over five years old at the brewery that, that we uh, have tasted uh, uh, and found to be quite delicious. So, Broom County Stout, uh, you know, from uh, 2007, uh, you know, people rave about that beer. Um, I've tasted a Pear Jacques from uh, 2000 and, uh, 2008 uh, a couple of a couple of weeks ago. It was still quite good. Uh, some of the first bottles of Matilda are still kicking around. Uh, they taste great. We have done some things at the brewery to 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 ensure that uh, ensure that the uh, the beer will uh, that it will last for five years. Very um, cool. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. So if you if you have any more of that 2008 uh, Jacques Pierre, by all means, you know, make free with it. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're all appreciative. <laughs> without well, a my doubt. address is 805. With me and Lee. You know, you guys. Uh, all, the 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 uh, Aladdin's Cave is open to you. All you need to do is come to Chicago. I'll show you right where it is. We'll go in there and. Uh, We'll grab a couple glasses and. Okay, we'll hang on. How do you guys? How do you spell Travelocity? Expedia. <laughs> hey, Chicago is only about seven hours away. I'm, I'm there. Excellent. <laughs> well, ten hours in the snow. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, yeah absolutely. So we recently we recently had a dinner. Um, we had a very unusual dinner for uh, some of our uh, some some special customers where we had. Uh, we have three different vintages of Sophie, three different vintages of Matilda, and then we had uh, we had those before dinner, and then uh, with dinner we had a, a vintage Pear Jacques, so a Pear Jacques that was uh, four years old, and then a, a new one, and it was it was it was fascinating, and um, I guess by the time we got round to the Pear Jacques, we may not have our our our. our uh, our uh, all of our you know, <laughs> may not our, have appreciated acuity may have been slightly impaired, but we have all enjoyed ourselves. Nice, Felix. Great. What was that you just poured? A uh, 2012 Perza. Yeah, you're gonna like that one. I suspect, without a doubt. Oh, it um, smells amazing. Yeah, the the nose on the Pierre on the Pierre Jacques is amazing. Uh, Mike, uh, question: You've got the talking yeah. stick. Go for it. Actually, and and I I think it's about time that we got Andrew to let him uh, talk a little bit because I know how marketing people like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I've seen it here demonstrated in Minnesota that seeing commercial brewers giving back to the community beyond just producing really good beer uh -huh. and leaving a lasting impact in Absolutely. various ways. And even I've got my own hype dreams of if I'm ever able to open a brewery slash tap room, sure. of being able to facilitate that sort of thing and, and keep starting the, um, the whole civic nature of the, the community and getting people involved. But uh -huh. what sort of things are Goose Island doing or even planning on doing in the near future to give back to the community. So let me let me let me start off, and then and I'll let Andrew kick. Brad likes to talk too. He remember he started in marketing with the opera. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> yeah, but he, yeah, but he showed his marketing roots when he fibbed about it. <laughs> yeah. I'm there just saying, just saying. It's a joke. So, so, um, I, like I said, I was going to, I, I was going to let Andrew talk about this. Um, you know, one of the things that we have done is uh, with our, our beer green line. I don't know whether you guys have had this beer before. Um, we uh, we have uh, used a, a portion of the proceeds to uh, uh, give money to the Nature Conservancy, and they have bought. Uh, uh, rainforest in Costa Rica, and we uh, we now uh, we we've, we've helped them buy uh, 125 acres of uh, Costa Rican uh, uh, rainforest. You know, but more importantly than that, we were talking about this the other day. Uh, John Hall, our founder, um, and who's still a, a an important part of our our uh, our brewery. Uh, he's more known as a philanthropist than uh, than really a, a a beer person. You know, he's got more he has had more uh, uh, pe more people in Chicago knew him as a as a, a person who gave back to Chicago uh, than than a, uh, than a than a than a than a beer maker and and that's something that we can we will continue to do we have to stay and now especially have to stay connected with the with with Chicago yeah. Chicago's our home and we need we need uh, people to know that we're their neighbors. We need people to know that that we're uh, we're we're excited to help them with uh, uh, their local events. We're we're involved in uh, so many charities that uh, I can't keep track of how many uh, how many uh, uh, auctions we've had for brewmaster dinners and uh, uh, and also uh, and also special tasting. So we we. We we definitely and especially now uh, uh, need to continue that legacy that that John started of being very connected to the the community. We want to be that, and uh, we want people to know that we're their neighbors and friends in Chicago. Yeah, that's really definitely important that. for any for any uh, endeavor these days. Community awareness is a, a huge huge piece of that. Miss um, Tara Carr. Hi. Are you ready this time? You have you sure. have right? you positive? <laughs> you sure? Um, am I muted? No, I'm not muted. Okay. <laughs> um, I was going to ask a question just because you guys have this partnership with AB InBev, and obviously, you know, we know that these bigger beer companies have some amazing quality control, as you pointed out, and a lot of things that help keep everyone in line and in order. Um. I was wondering how that helps with how you guys get to experiment with doing new things with beer. Because I can imagine there's a lot of smaller craft breweries out there who learn some really expensive lessons when they're just kind of trying to develop something new. And with all of the, I'm sure, amazing labs that they have and, and uh, quality assurance programs, that it's a big help uh, to kind you know, of have I, that there as a, as a tool, and I was wondering if there was like a, a specific example, if it was something about a new barrel aging technique or something that it just really was a positive experience having that relationship. Well, you know, I would, I would, uh, and and that, uh, I, I kind of disagree with that. I would say that uh, the most sophisticated tool that uh, that any brewer or or or, or a beer drinker can use is there. Are, is their sense of taste and smell, and that even with a GC olfactory mass spec, you can't. Uh, it, it doesn't tell you you've made a good beer. So we we haven't. We have. We continue to. Uh, we continue to innovate, and I would say that that's probably the reason. Uh, one of the reasons why AB uh, purchased us because we are. Uh, we were the first brewery to uh, barrel age uh, uh, a, a imperial stout in a. Uh, a bourbon barrel. Uh, we were we were we've been pioneers of uh, of the use of tannomyces and 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 barrel aging in uh, uh, wine barrels. And we've done. Uh, uh, I think they that 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 is one of the things that caught their eye. We haven't had. Uh, they're they're not. Uh, they don't do that. Uh, that's not their. Uh, that, that isn't what they've been concentrating on. And 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 so we're really the. Uh, we're really the, the in the United States. I would say that uh, that, that we're uh, 
you know, we're one of the, the, the leading breweries when it comes to barrel aging. We've got a very, very large and diverse group of barrels. That I would I would say there's there's more uh, there's more barrel knowledge in uh, there's more barrel knowledge in uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in Belgium in in Leuven at the uh, at the uh, headquarters there and the, the, we recently had a, a, a visit from a woman named uh, 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 Femke Femke Stursik and she is a PhD student who works at in Leuven who wrote her. Uh, uh, her uh, doctoral dissertation on uh, barrel aging, but she, uh, you know, she came to our our brewery to uh, learn what she could about what we're doing there, and we we, we learn from each other. So that's it. That is an instance where we've we, we've had some synergies, but we're well oh. ahead of uh, we're well ahead of what uh, we're doing. Things that that uh, AB uh, hasn't uh, isn't really that in, enormously involved in. And, hey, uh, Brett, one more question for you real quick, uh, and then I think we're, we're over our time, so we're probably going to be bringing this to a close. Um, what about Goose Islands, uh, if you have any? What about uh, cask offerings? You know, we have, uh, we have uh, avoided uh, cask beers, um, and I'll tell you why, because fur can get damaged and stolen out in the trade. And uh, we we do uh, we do participate in the the uh, uh, you know the, the, the festival of of, uh, of cask beers that uh, happens in our uh, in our uh, uh, our uh, brew pub in Wrigleyville near the near uh, uh, the baseball stadium. Um, but we're we're uh, we're you know we're we're always thinking about making some more cask beers. I you know I grew. Uh, my first job, we made only cask beers, and I, it's very close, near and dear to my heart. It's not very well done in the United States, and yeah, I we we have that. a long ways to go there. Yeah. All right. Well, very cool. We're looking forward to seeing something from you on cask. Uh, tell me where it is, anywhere within the state of Texas, and I'll make the damn road trip to go get that bastard. You know, okay. You guys, you guys, <laughs> all of you. You know, all of you need to come to Chicago and and take I'm a look in. at our barrel aging program, and also uh, go visit our our pub uh, in on you know our original location that started where we started in '88. They always have great beer on cask, and it's always all well right. conditioned, and it's also served you, right. Off the top of your heads, do either one of you know the street address for that pub? 1800 Shot. North Clybourne. There you go. Shout Shot it out. That's Sounds the like name a hill. That's the name of the brew pub, right? Yeah. Bizarre Excellent. Hey, what about, what about any any sours, real quick? Any sours on the horizon? Yes, yeah, a couple new ones. One called Halia, which is uh, uh, which is peaches and um, uh, Britannomyces uh, clasinii, and that's going to come out uh, uh, in late summer. Also, um, we're another sour that is new is one called Jillian. That is uh, made with uh, strawberries, white pepper, honey, a secondary fermentation with champagne yeast, a little Britannomyces bruxellensis, um, and that beer is actually in a in a uh, tank right now, waiting to be centrifuged and uh, and packaged. And we will hold on to it probably until September. Well, is, well if if you, need, that, if you need if you need quality control Juliet? feedback, if you need What's quality. That? Control feedback. Let us know. <laughs> well, uh, Gil, guys, Gil, guys, what was your question? The, you what about what about Juliet? Yet, so. Do you guys do make Juliet? Yes, Juliet is still being made. Yep. And we tasted it recently, and it's ready to it's ready to, uh, to take out of the barrel. Because that's a sour as well, right? Yes, it is. Made with uh, Michigan blackberries. Brett, what oh, were you excellent. About to say about us? I'm looking forward to that. You said we so, we seem like what, Brett? What's that? You no, said something. Oh, okay. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and close this down for the public broadcast at this point. We're uh, a few minutes over, but not too bad being that we uh, we started late. Uh, during the course of tonight, I put down the entire uh, Pierre Jacques, and if you have this available, go out and get it. It's worth the trip. Yep. Easily worth the trip. Okay. You know, would, if you let me say one last thing, and yeah, I, yeah, by all means. I hope that you guys uh, will. Uh, you know, these are uh, these 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 uh, uh, beers in the 765 milliliter bottles. They're very special beers, but uh, you know, we feel like 
are uh, the offerings that are now available in the 50 states are IPA and our Honkers Ale and our seasonals are also special products and we hope that people will try those as well. Well, I just have one thing before we close. Um, I know uh, Brett is the brewery uh, said a lot of, but Andrew, I when I post about this Goose Island uh, interview, I got a lot of mixed feelings about the whole AB and Dev thing. Do you want to say something for our viewers, like a maybe a thirty second answer to those that really bash this whole interview and the whole? A, B, and Bav, Goose Island thing? What I would say is that, and, and we all feel this way at Goose, we stand by the quality of our beers. We make the beers, we quality control our beers, and, and we love the beers that we make. And to me, personally, it comes down to the beer that's in the glass. It's this. And, and we make amazing beers. I fell in love with these beers, and you know we continue to make them. Brett leads an amazing brewing team, um, and, and he interacts with with some brewers on the ABN Bev side that um, I've seen personally are really really passionate about making some incredible beers for us. And, and so you, you can get into you know the politics of of who owns who and, 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 and scale and all of that. But at the end of the day, grab the beer and drink it and, and tell me that it doesn't taste amazing because all of our beers taste amazing. Um, so, you know, it, it goes from 312 all the way to Bourbon County Stout. Um, they're, they're, they're all delicious beers. So, Yeah, I you know, Andy, to top that off, um, I can be as much of a beer snob as anybody on the planet. Um, but I've always said that for the, the true micros that start out as independent, that get pulled into InBev, uh, Saab Miller Coors, anybody else, um, protest the business practices if you want to, but don't protest the beer because in a lot of cases those beers still end up holding their quality. You guys are a solid two years into the, the purchase, the acquisition by uh, InBev, and there's nothing wrong with Goose Island beer. Nothing whatsoever. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. All right. So having said that, uh, guys on the panel and lady on the panel, I am not reading from Wikipedia, Michael. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Michael just accused me from reading from Wikipedia. No. That's, you know, that's the way I feel. It protests the business practices because InBev does get aggressive with them. But drink the beer for what it is. Uh, I'm just messing with you. This is I know you are. Right. Anyone has any questions? Pear Jack, um, I love. I've had Sophie, Matilda, all all the Belgians, plus their variety regular pack. Most it's good stuff. Great. It's yeah, good I mean, stuff. If you want to bitch about it, come to the come to the community on, on Google Plus and bitch about it, and Andrew will smack you down. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. Here's here's a good point. Just like like Brett said earlier, they're in they're in all fifty states now, and and probably I'm I'm willing to bet the farm that if if the AB purchase didn't happen, then they wouldn't be in yeah. fifty states, and a lot of people who are watching this right now, and you know other people across the country, wouldn't be able to enjoy some of these great beers. Hey, real so quick, what, what, what's our hate mail again, Lee? Uh, our hate mail is Eric McKee at gmail dot com. Okay, um, one you last me too. real quick question for you, Andrew. Um, before the InBev, after the InBev distribution, how many states? Um, before we were in every state that touched Illinois, every state that touched that, plus Kentucky, and then uh, we were with Red Hook and Widmer a little bit on the West Coast, so we had some in. In Oregon, Washington, Little 15, in Idaho, and California. 15 to 20, maybe? I'd say 23 to 25, okay. somewhere in there. Okay. But now you're now you're nationwide. We are. Excellent. And Europe, All right. right? We do ship some beer to the UK, yeah. Well, it, it's hard to argue with that sort of distribution process. All right. Anyway, we're going to switch over uh, on the panel and with our guests. We're going to switch over to the after party, so sit tight for those of you watching us. Um, we don't know what we have next after this. Matthew and Gil are both beating the bushes looking for brewers. If you are a craft brewer and you would like to come on, 
talk to these guys. Circle them on G+. Send them emails. Send them, like, you know, young young ladies' pictures. Whatever you have to do. <laughs> Get on board, okay? Wow. And uh, what? <laughs> what? I just... I, I was on a roll till you guys... <laughs> you, know, I, you went off the roll. You went off. I think that was a, a downhill roll. <laughs> oh, God. I'm trying to get gravity to work gravity with me took for over. crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, anyway. Cheers and good night. Yep. Cheers and good night, everybody. Have a good evening.